Uh, it was 3,800 miles in seven days, a trip I'm not looking for. It. Well, beautiful, America's beautiful, but it's a lot of miles in the car. So I dropped my daughter off at um, Trinity Lutheran Camp in Big Horn, Montana, where she will serve this summer at the Lutheran, the Lutheran Camp Counselor. So a beautiful sea. It was wonderful to see our great nation. Many miles in the car, and it's glad to be back with you. Every once in a while, I think it's really good for all of us to ask this question. What are you trying to accomplish and what will it look like when you get there? I think it's wise for us Christians to once in a while sit back and say, just what is it that I'm trying to accomplish with my life? A bigger bank account, more friends, more fame, a bigger house, maybe a successful family, maybe finding the bride or husband of my dreams, maybe a wonderful career. Just what is it that you and I are trying to accomplish as we walk? And what's it going to look like when we get there? And right now I think we, we're taking some time to thank Angie for her uh, many years of walking with us, helping the youth and young people and small group Bible studies and the families of our church walk closer to the Lord. But what will it look like when you get to where you want to be in your life? I think every once in a while we have to answer that question, a dear brother pastor of mine always asked me a question when I was a pastor at my previous congregation, just what is it that you're trying to accomplish there? And I think it's good for us to ask that question, just what is it that we're trying to accomplish at St. John Lutheran Church in Defiance, Ohio? There are individuals who I believe, um, many famous, many successful, who have defined what they're trying to accomplish and maybe they left in the past little markers and little sayings. For example, I was in Wisconsin, only about an hour south of Lambeau Field. Vince Lombardi once said, winning isn't everything, it's what? The only thing. Now, Vince came back and said, don't take that out of context. I was just saying that to motivate my players. But that's a saying that has stuck with a lot of people. So the goal of any successful coach is that you win. World War II, behind the scenes, Omar Bradley that helped uh, unite the Allied forces once made the statement, in war there is no prize for second place. It's true. Nobody gets a runner's-up trophy in war. They usually have to rebuild their nation. Dale Earnhardt, who died many years ago, a successful driver, said second place is just the first what? Loser. He sort of identified what he wanted in life. If I didn't win, I just lost. No matter how much you want to say. Gordon Gecko, Wall Street, greed is what? Good. He knew what he wanted to accomplish in life. More and more money, more and more fame. He didn't care how he did it. So he told a group of investors that greed is good. Forget about being compassionate. We're in business to make money, have a fatter checking account. Greed is good. He knew what he wanted. I saw some of these sites on the way to Montana. I continue to see them. Thomas Jefferson said to Lewis and Clark in the Great Expedition, to discover the Northwest and find a passage to the Pacific. The object of your mission is the Pacific Ocean, and there is a Pacific Ocean behind them. They had one single goal. So all these people had goals. No second place in war. Agreed is good. Second place, just the first loser. Get to the Pacific Ocean. I don't know if you remember Apollo 13, when Apollo 13 had its difficulties, its technological difficulties out in space. Failure is not an option. We want to bring them all back safely home. All these people knew what they wanted to do. And so hence we come to Daniel, who was a bright, handsome young man, who the Babylonians took with them when their kingdom fell due to idolatry. And the Babylonians took the best and left the rest. He's a bright young man, and he knew what he was about. I will not follow any pagan or heathen decree. I'll continue to pray to God, the one true God, no matter what it cost me. And so his adversaries, who were somewhat jealous of his success, trapped him where he was found praying to Yahweh and his punishment was to be thrown into a what? A lion's den. He said, so be it. I knew what I want to accomplish. My life is going to be faithful to Yahweh, faithful to God, the first commandment. You shall have no other what? God's. He knew what he wanted. I will remain faithful to God even though I'm a foreigner in a pagan land. God is still God. And there he said this. He knew what he wanted to accomplish. For he is a living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He knew what he wanted to accomplish even though he was a prisoner in a pagan foreign land. He still set a witness. He still knew who God was. He knew what he wanted. May we have such faith. 
Now, I'm sort of giving you a, a warning sign here. I think that's what I'm saying. Uh, in the movie Master and Commander of the Far Side of the Ocean, you know I'm a movie guy, um, the captain of the ship was sent out to capture a French ship twice as big as his, the Asheron, um, Captain Jack, and he always told his soldiers and even his officers, everything I do is subject to the requirements of the service. I was sent out by king and crown during the Napoleonic Wars to capture this French ship, and I will do anything that's possible. So anytime you ask me anything during this voyage, everything is subject to the requirements of the what? The service. You know we're going by the Galapagos Islands with its wonderful creation there and nature there, even though we're traveling through difficult weather. Everything I will do, I'm subject to the requirements of the service, and king and crown told me to capture this French ship, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. He saw his whole journey there focused on one point, subject to the requirements of the service. Now hold on to that. So God gathered to himself all the people that he delivered from Egypt, and as you heard, read to you from the book of Exodus, God gathered to himself his people at Mount Sinai to be his people, and he said this to them, I'm 100% in, I'm all for you. You're the people I delivered from the hand of, of the foreign and pagan god Pharaoh, and you are going to be my people. And I brought you out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and I carried you on as in eagle's wings. You know how an eagle soars? It doesn't have to flap. It locks its wings, and the wind itself lifts it up. Hence, we are lifted up on eagle's wings. We just lock ourselves in God Almighty. The power of the Holy Spirit lifts us up to places by His grace. I carried you out on eagle's wings. I'm 100% for you. And I brought you to me. I called you. I called you to be my people by my grace. And you're my nation for my people. God's 100% in for His people. And what do you be? God calls him to be 100% in. Moses and the nation of Israel assembled in front of God. Now, this is what God said, Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, you will be for me a treasured possession. You will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, and the world will know who you are and that the Messiah will come from you. And I want you to obey me. I want you to be 100% in. In other words, Israel, I want you to be subject to the requirements of the service. You are my people, and this is now the path you are to walk subject to requirements of the service because I am your God and you are my people and you will be a witness. You'll be a light to the nation. You'll be a priesthood. You'll be a holy nation. In other words, as I said, you are subject to requirements of my service. Why? Because I gave you identity. I brought you out of slavery. I claimed you as my own. You are my holy people. I'm promising you a Messiah who's going to come from you. I'm simply asking that you now see your life subject to me, your God, who gave you life, who gave you grace, who gave you a purpose. And they are to see themselves as subject to the requirements of my service. See, we believers too, we really are the new Israel. We are a chosen people, chosen by God. We didn't choose God, God chose us. He called us in the waters of baptism. For some reason, we heard his word and we believe that Jesus died and rose for us. This isn't something that we decide to do. We're not better than anyone or smarter or more holier than anyone. We are chosen by God, by his grace, as God all wants all to be saved. And we are a holy nation. The church is, throughout the world, those who confess Christ, the people belonging to me, the same type of language that we hear from the Old Testament Israel, we are the New Testament Israel. The same language, the same people, and what is our calling? Well, we're set aside for a particular purpose. What? Well, you know, subject to the service, subject to the requirements of the service. Set aside to be God's people for a purpose. Saved by grace. Not because we're good, but that Christ died for all of us. As you read in the epistle, for you are saved by grace through faith, which isn't a work of any one of us. Surely by God's grace, for we are all sinners. Saved by grace, trained and guided. Through what? We'll come to worship and we hear the creeds and we hear the word and we come to Bible study and we mature. We're trained and guided for something much greater. And 
we keep the Ten Commandments. So it's to that that I wish to speak to you today. The Ten Commandments, what does it look like? Well, it's the first commandment, you shall have no other what? So what are you hoping the most? Where do you put your hope? As I teach in Life with God class, if your worst nightmare tonight would come true, what would it be? If your worst nightmare came true tonight and someone called you up at 3 o'clock in the morning and said this and this is your worst nightmare, what would it be? Are you all thinking on something tragic? The death of a child? Oh, your spouse is no longer alive? We're in a bad war? What would it be? Well, the worst nightmare of all would be that there would be no God and Christ's death and resurrection is not real. That's the ultimate nightmare. We have no hope. You shall have no other what? To that thing for which I look in good, and that thing to where I look to protect me, that is my God. The second commandment, you shall not take my name in what? Honor it with my life. Honor his name. When I say I'm going to do something in God's name, I'm going to do it. To Dr. Martin Luther, the second commandment is kept when we say we do something in God's name, and we do it. And it's broken when we say we do something in God's name and we don't do it. Now, of course, cussing and swearing by God's name is never okay when it's done in vain. The third commandment, remember the Sabbath day by what? We keep it holy, we come to God's house to hear his word, to believe his word, to trust his word, to receive his blessings, a day of rest. Yes, we all should take a day of rest. We all need to take a day of rest. As God, That's why God did himself. He rested on the Sabbath day. But really, as the meaning of the third commandment says, come to gladly hear and know and believe his word. That's why you come to God's house, to be fed and to be nourished. The fourth commandment is what? Honor your what? It means that we respect God-ordained authority. Our father and mother are representatives of God, and hence from that institution comes all authority on earth, even civil authority, and yes, at times we may need to keep civil authority in check and constrained, and we only recognize that authority which is ordained properly by God. In Acts, we are told as believers that we must obey God rather than men when authority asks us to sin, and when authority oversteps itself in the bounds of morality, then we are called to hold it in check. But remember that all authority comes from God, and God holds authority because it keeps us safe and protects us from evil. The fifth commandment, you shall not what? Krill or murder. Everyone is precious in his sight. Red and yellow, black and white. Everyone is made in the image of God. And Jesus Christ died for who? Everyone. Christ died once and for all. As St. John tells us in 1 John, he's just not the propitiation for our sins, but the sin of the entire what? World. For God so loved the what? World. All life is sacred. All life is sacred from the unborn to natural death. The sixth commandment, you shall not commit what? Adultery. Marriage is an institution from God. It's the greatest of earthly institutions. From, from it comes healthy families healthy societies, blessed societies. The seventh commandment, you shall not what? That means that we're not only told to take other people's property, but we're also told to protect other people's property and income. Protect other people's property and income because from that they care for themselves and their families. The eighth commandment, you shall not bear what? Fault and witness against your neighbor. Martin Luther said, next to my faith and your faith, and my life and your life, our reputation is the greatest thing we have. To slander someone is to harm their reputation, and reputations many times when they're harmed are not easily put back together. So hence we are told to not bear false witness against their neighbor, not to listen to gossip, to put the best construction on what? All things. And to speak our neighbor when we're offended or they offend us. The ninth and tenth commandment, you shall not what? Covet. Oftentimes when I teach that lesson to my confirmands, I have them take out a sheet of paper, and I tell them this, I'd give you a million dollars if you can prove to me your need to have it. I give them a blank sheet of paper and give them ten minutes and say, if you can prove your need to have it, I'll give you a million dollars. And they all begin writing really fast all the stuff they, they want, right? 
And in recovery, man, I know I need a million dollars. And when you come down to it, nobody can give me a single reason that they need a million dollars because everything that they put down they needed, it was their what? Want. I want nicer clothes. I don't have anything nice to wear. My friend has a better bike than I do. My friend has a better car. Well, that's not what you need. That's what you what? Want. We are told not to covet. St. Paul says this, with food and clothing we shall be content. Subject to the requirements of the service. In other words, just as God told his people in the Old Testament, he tells us now, keep the Ten Commandments. You know, America, we have thousands and thousands and thousands of rules and books and books and books, and we hire lawyers and pay them hundreds of dollars all to interpret what's right and wrong when God simply gave us what? How many rules? Very simple. You keep the ten, you don't need the other thousands. That's just me. What do you think? Let's go through it real quickly. You should have no other what? Don't take the Lord's name in what? Honor your father and what? Mother, right? Oh, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it what? Sorry, you skipped one. Yeah. Honor your father and mother. You shall not what? Shall not commit. Shall not steal. Yeah. Shall not bear false witness against your what? And shall not covet your neighbor's things or people. Very simple. God out of love. Now, many times you and I, we don't keep it. Matter of fact, we're often very guilty once we start cracking it open. But there, Christ's grace forgives us and redeems us. Christ kept it perfectly for us. Keep the Ten Commandments. We are set aside for a particular purpose and led to bring the world out of darkness into his marvelous light and friends in Christ for the past three or four months, even though it's been very awkward and painful with the COVID situation, with the racial tensions in America, with the fear and the dread we see on TV, with the pain we see, it's a wonderful time for us believers to say, my hope's in Christ. In spite of the world that seems falling around, falling apart around us, it's a wonderful time for us believers to speak the hope we have in Jesus Christ and the love that we have for all. Led the world out of darkness into his marvelous light to speak to the hope we have in Jesus Christ who overcomes all this. What a marvelous time that God has given to us. Our lives are subject to the what? Requirements of the service. Jesus died for me, I'm his child. Jesus died for you, you're his child. And I'll live my life as a child of God. That's a path that God has put me on. Keep the Ten Commandments, love God, love my neighbor. So you see different places there, I really like it. That's sort of a Lutheran circle because we see our lives, our vocations as a calling from God. What? You see it all there in our careers, in our family, in helping those less fortunate. You take a look at the picture there. Maybe where do you fit in there? Correct? Our lives are subject to the requirements of the service. Jesus Christ, who calls out of darkness. We're all called people. We're a holy nation, a priesthood of all believers. That's who we are. So for the closing thought, I, I pulled it from our new catechism, question 144. And the question says this, how do I serve and obey God? Can you answer it for me? That's our closing thought. Let's read it all together. I serve and obey God when I use all my gifts within my various walks of life, vocations, for my well-being and that of my neighbor and wider creation. God puts me into a network of relationships with people around me whom I'm called to serve. God gave me freedom to pursue my vocations in accord with skills and aptitudes he has given me. And all God's people say, Amen.